Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is organizing a great regatta, learning the secrets of successful events. Uh, my name is Anderson Reggio, uh, formerly the race manager where I used to work for Brad Reed uh, at Sailing Newport, now the owner of Reggio Sailing Services. Uh, our panelists, we have Randy Drass, the race director of Charleston Race Week, uh, Lou Sandoval, the race chairman of Chicago Mac Race, and then Brad Reed, uh, the executive director of Sail Newport. Uh, these three guys here, they're a phenomenal group, amazing resource, uh, they're amazing race organi organizers. This could go on for a long time. Uh, we ask that you guys hold your questions till the end, but uh, that stated, we'll all be up here. Uh, if you guys have any questions, any information that uh, you want to know about that we don't have time to get to in the hour that we have here, uh, we'll stick around for a little bit. These guys run events at a pretty high level, uh, dealing with large quantities of competitors, very high value sponsors, uh, but a lot of what they have for knowledge uh, can be scaled up, scaled down, uh, to hopefully benefit you guys with your organizations, your yacht clubs, and uh, any of the events that you run. So with that, uh, if I can ask you guys first to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about the events that you guys uh, are associated with. I'm Randy Drafts and I'm uh, Charleston Race Week and been running Race Week for now probably about seven years. So we've uh, experienced quite a bit of growth over the, that time and I've learned a lot, I guess, I hope. So hopefully we can share that with you today. I'm Lou Sandoval and um, I'm, I'm past Mac Chair. That's the best part about being chairman is being the past chairman. Um, I just came off my term. Um, I've had a, a variety of different experience levels at, uh, at the course level, running buoy races, and then I'm now entering my 10th year of being on the MAC committee. Um, now I'm obviously being past chair. It's a great thing, because I get it, it's like being a grandparent, I guess. Although I don't know what that's like. It's kind of like, you know, you look from afar. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I'm Brad Reed. I'm the executive director of Sail Newport, and I've been there since 1998. And uh, seen a lot of different regattas that have come through our doors and gone out our doors. Some very successful, some that we saw some flaws in. Uh, but regattas have changed a lot over the last 15, 17 years, specifically in the media, specifically in the uh, kind of needs of the regattas in terms of sponsorship and, else, and, and other things. But the one thing I hope I can add to this is that it's still about the participants. And I want to just make sure we're always focusing. We can be the best media, we can have the best press, but if your regatta on the water, and regatta on land suffers for the participants, they're going to go away unhappy. So, thanks. Well, thanks, guys, for being here. Um, sort of, we chose to break this topic down for everybody sort of into three subsects, uh, sort of business of the business side of an event, uh, promotion, PR, making your event happen, and then event administration. So starting first off with the business side of things, exactly how do you guys measure when you look back when an event is completed? How do you measure that success for an event? Start with who, whoever's. I'll, I'll jump on that one first. You know, one of the things that uh, we've done the organizational structure of the MAC race is we operate in a 360 degree type environment. So what we'll do after every race, usually about two to three weeks after the race, is we survey all the participants. That's skippers and crew members. We do a survey monkey to everybody and we ask them a series of about 20, 25 questions uh, related to different events on the race. We take that feedback. We also survey the volunteers as well, internal, kind of get their feedback. Um, our race committee, our on the water committee, actually does their own survey of their operations. And usually we're our own worst critics, but it's great to hear the feedback from other people, so. Perfect, we, we split it into uh, two or three different levels of uh, uh, looking at, at the matrix of, of a success or, or less than successful event. First is, is the race management on the water? Did we do a good job? Were our volunteers properly trained? Uh, did we effectively manage the conditions that we were presented? Uh, also, off the water, were our functions uh, were our functions uh, uh, well run? Were they? Were they was the? Uh, uh, did we hit our, our numbers at the end of the day? Did we make sure we had a dollar in the bank uh, at the end of the regatta? Sometimes that doesn't. Sometimes it does. So there's definitely financial, um, but certainly the surveys are important. And we started doing surveys in 2009 uh, for three different events that we ran. Uh, and, and the feedback 
both positive and negative from those really helped us move forward. So surveys are, are key. I mean, I'll echo that. I mean, it's, it's Getting, you know, it's talking to the competitors, it's communicating to the competitors what they wanted, what they experienced through the event that uh, allows us to shape. I mean, planning for our event starts, you know, somebody said, when, you know, when do you start on your event? Well, it's almost a year and a half out, you know, to get things going. And we're, we're it's all totally sailor driven. I mean, I, I can't, you know, what Brad said earlier, it's all about the sailor. And I think, Anderson's debt it used to be you know, a customer, you know, the race committee, and that's what we expected out of the PROs as well. But the thing that we really try to do is listen to the competitors. You know, we'll do the survey. And we, we have uh, a, a slightly different model. Sail Newport runs somewhere between 12 and 16 fairly large events a, a summer, from a 35 to 40 kid youth regatta to a massive 450 kid youth regatta to a 120 boat around the island race to a, a nine boat um, uh, uh, kind of corporate outing on our J-22s. So every event has slightly different um, requirements and you judge those events quite a bit differently. Unlike a Chicago Mac or a Charleston Race Week, which is, you know, it's a mammoth, mammoth undertaking. We have a ton of events, so we're going back to back to back. And, and the burnout rate, we measure our burnout rate, right? That's how we measure our regatta schedule. And uh, by about June 3rd, we're burnt out in Newport, so. Well, I mean, it's tough, it's tough to talk. You touched a little bit on it, uh, talking about the finance side of things. Uh, with that, everybody always talks about sponsorship. Uh, so what sort of sponsorship do you guys look for with the events that you run? And then how do you guys go about getting that sponsorship? Well, first of all, we at Sail Newport, we try to budget without sponsors to, to find out what the true costs are. And then we back the, the needs for sponsors in. At Sail Newport, the Newport Regatta, which is one of our signature events, it's usually 18 or 19 classes. It's a pretty good sized budget, but we budget exactly to break even with the entry fees, and then we try to bring in sponsors. And what does that sponsorship dollars do? It makes the parties better. It makes sure that, the, that we can hire Media Pro. It, it, we start ramping up the expenses as we get these sponsors. It is hard to get sponsors. We're in it for the long haul. This thing's gonna be here with or without sponsors. That's our goal, that's our mission to run this regatta with or without funding from sponsors. We're gonna make it happen. We're gonna keep your regatta fees low, but some years you're gonna have chips and salsa, and yes, Alan, buy your own beer. Other times, we're gonna be able to have filet mignon, and we've had it both ways. We've had big sponsors. Our newest sponsor, Bacardi, is allowing us to ramp it up. If we lose that and we don't have somebody to fill them in, we'll still hold the regatta and we might have to tone it down. So for the Mac race over the last decade, we've seen an evolution of sponsorship from, um, and I think when we, I first started on the committee, we added Lexus as a presenting sponsor many, many moons ago. And then we evolved into having Land's End Business Outfitters. And then most recently, we've had Bouffe Clicquot, the champagne company. And you know, I guess if I look at those different you know, episodes, the ones that have really worked best for the race, and, I, and this kind of is one of the reasons why we're all here this week, is we've got to step outside our demographic of sailing, you know? You've got to find somebody that brings, it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a partnership, so you've got to find somebody that brings something to the table that you don't already have. It's great to have, you know, a sponsor like, uh, you know, like, like, like Beneteau or like J-Boats or somebody that's already in the business, but they're already bringing the same demographic that you already have. They're, we're talking to ourselves in that arrangement. If you bring somebody like a Bouffe Clicquot or a Land's End that, that has a lot of mainstream customers that know nothing about sailing, that's a positive because you're extending the reach of the sport. Um, they're bringing a different dynamic. Uh, one of the goals and metrics that we set out during my tenure as a MAC chair, outside of running a safe race where nobody, you know, we had no issues and that our tracking work was that we extended the outreach of the sport. So working with Bouffe Clicquot in that partnership worked, um, worked as a, a very strong component of that. We did this event at the NNAV Pier, for those of you that have been to Chicago, called A Shore Thing. And that evolved over like the last decade from uh, a, just a, an end of the pier parade of boats where every competitor had to go by and we had a few hundred people to last year where we had over 2,800 people at that event. At the NNAV Pier, it was a big social event. There were families having picnics and the whole thing. I mean, that's just, 
that for that presence in a major city like Chicago, it's a big thing. Because I mean, if we don't have politicians going to jail, it's hard. You know, it's hard to get. It's hard, it's really hard to get in the newspaper with the, with the sailing event because those guys steal all our thunder. You know, they're they're always in the news going to jail. So it's really hard to, you know, it's really hard to kind of get. Uh, you know, get, get any news coverage on something like that. So that's that's our perspective on that. But it started with an evaluation of our network, the worth of the, of the race. We utilized a service called IEG. Um, that set a baseline for where we could go to position and sit down with, with the sponsor and say, hey, listen, this is what we think we're worth. You know, and then that started the negotiation process. Yeah. But uh, sort of along those lines, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about going out and getting non-industry sponsors. You know? We spend a lot of these times in these rooms talking about branching out outside of the, the normal demographic uh, that, that we all surround ourselves in. How exactly do you go about throwing that carrot at the end of the stick to get somebody like Lou, Cl Lou Clouteau on board? I think a lot of it's six degrees of separation. I mean, when you've got a yacht club in a major metropolitan area, everybody knows somebody who knows somebody. So you work your, you work your contacts, you work your Rolodex, and you find an in with some of these people. I mean. The racing community is very unique. We all know this. I mean, we all wear shorts and shirts and we sail on boats. It, it's on the land that you find out what somebody knows. Oh, they're a CEO of XYZ company, or they are, you know, the PR person for this firm. That, that I mean, you start to make those connections and you work, you work self-interest, you know? It, that's basically what it's about. Yeah, Randy, Randy. Yeah, um, you know, to circle back, I think a little bit budget-wise, you know, what, Race Weeks enjoyed is just this tremendous growth. So to be honest, we've had the luck of sponsors coming to us, you know, at this point. But it took us a long time to get us to that point. And, you know, we're talking about big events. You're talking about your local events and how you get started. And you sort of have to circle back to Brad's pot. You know, you've got to have a business plan. It's, it, it is a business. We talked about this in our little conference. You know, it's a mission statement. There's a lot of little things. And it has to be then revenue driven, like any good business. And that allows you to reach out. And once you know what your costs are, then you know what you need for sponsorship and, and what you, you're going to be able to provide a better value for your sponsor, too. So, I mean, and that's something that I think we have done very well in that we've had almost all of our sponsors come back and back and back because we've always kind of underselled, over delivered, you know, to them. But you have to start somewhere. Right. And, and I think personally, uh, our biggest success in sponsors have been those that are tied into the community sailing center and not just the, the five day event or the three day event. Someone who cares that wants to be a part of something for a long time, whether it's a whole year or a series of three years. And, and it is so important that you give that sponsor an opportunity to buy into your organizations, whether it's your yacht club, your sailing center, tie in your youth program, however, it, ha whatever that hook is, because you could find the CMO or the, or the CEO or the uh, COO, but ultimately you're going to have to go to their sponsor agencies. You're going to have to talk to their marketing people. And if you don't have a good plan to, to captivate that marketing guy or girl who's in that room, you're not gonna get it. I don't care how powerful the CEO is, I don't care how powerful the COO is, because they're certainly gonna rely on the smart people that they've hired to make the right advertising decisions. And sometimes sailing's not the right advertising decision. I know what all of us think it is, but you have to get that hook. Is it a hook into the city? Is it a hook into the state? Is it a hook into your, your programming? Find the hook, exploit the hook. You, to Brad, uh, to Brad's point, one of the things that you also got to look at is the fulfillment side of it. Because it's really, I mean, in any sa sales organization, you've got the guys that do the pitch and then the back office guys that actually make sure that you're delivering on the contract, the agreement that you have. You have to really make sure, I mean, part of our survey process is sitting down with our sponsors after the race and saying, what do you guys think? And just shutting up and listening to them. What could we do better? You know, how did it go? Like, what could we do? You know, what didn't go so well? And you got to make sure that they're getting there return on investment because ultimately you're that marketing person whose budget is coming out of whose neck is on the line for having written that check is the one that's going to have the answer to the board or whoever they're answering to. So you got to make sure that that's there. And that, you know, let's just break that down to the, you know, to the small organizational level. If you're running a, you know, a, a, a hundred boat regatta, the same thing happens. You know, if you've got the local, you know, car dealer in town, you've got to make sure that he's, he, you know, there's something in it for him and that he feels like he's walking away with it. So at, at that level as well, you're, you're, you gotta make sure that there's fulfillment. Yeah, yeah I think you, you, 
guys have touched on it and it's been a common theme and will probably continue to be for the next couple of days. It's all about fostering good relationships, using the connections that you have, developing new relationships with organizations that might be outside of, uh, outside the realm of what we're all, all used to uh, and, and making those foster. Uh, but oftentimes when, when we talk about running a great regatta, the most important relationship is the relationship that you guys have with the competitors. So with that, how exactly do you guys go about promoting your events to competitors and setting reasonable expectations for what they will see when they finally arrive for day one of racing? Um, you, we, we adopted social media pretty early on, and that's continued to be kind of one of our mainstays. Um, you know, we've used websites, online, media, but social media has been a huge asset to keep the competitors you know, aware of what we're going on. We're trying to be very open on what our intentions are and what we're trying to do so that there aren't any surprises. You know, when they come and show up in Charleston, it should be pretty clear to them. And uh, we work that all pretty hard. So that's, I mean, we actually have a you know, full-time social media person working the event as we speak. I think in the world of electronics, I, social media is a big thing for us. Uh, I, on the Race to Mackinac, one of the things that we do is communicate ahead of time. There's a stream of emails that go out to competitors that, you know, that communicate starting with, you know, the end of one season. So the race is in July, so starting in August, we start, you know, doing the wrap-up communication with them. And then towards the end of the year, we do the, the follow-up finish. We have, we have our award ceremony in November, and then to kick off the following January, we start the invitation process so the communication trail starts again and it's a continual stream you know every other month or as things come up to keep them abreast of things um, to Randy's point about managing expectations I think that's very important you know this year we were posed with the challenge of lower uh, water levels in Lake Michigan um, so we were worried all right we've got you know 300 plus boats a lot of them have drafts of eight plus feet what are we going to do with them in the harbor system the year prior we had a little bit of a snafu on the island because you know the water levels were the water levels were low. So we started setting that expectation. Hey guys, it could be a, you know, you've gotta be open to docking in any one of the three locations. So we started laying the worst case scenario. Mother Nature, Mother Nature blessed us with a little bit of a, of a wet spring and we got, you know, 12, 12 inches back of water. So that kind of, you know, ameliorated itself. But at, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you gotta manage that expectation so there's no surprise. These guys covered a lot of it. <clears throat> it's managing the expectations from the time that you invite the classes to your regattas to uh, making sure that the information on housing, where your boat's gonna go in the water, where your boat's gonna dock, having that signage when you come into the facility to make sure that there is no guessing where people are going. And the thing that we learned back before I even started at Sail Newport was on the water uh, communication Basically, it changed in 1995 with his dad. Luigi came into the picture and he was a sailor and it wasn't the us versus them attitude that sometimes race management and competitors had in the 1970s and 80s. The 90s opened it up and now all of us have embraced, probably sometimes go overboard on our communication, but every regatta that you run, you should have good on the water communication with VHFs whether it's a PHRF regatta, a One Design regatta, like we talked about in the, in the, uh, the youth regatta section earlier, uh, talk to the coaches, talk to the parents if you're running a kid regatta, that on the water communication is crucial to having a successful experience on the water. So yeah, you talk about having successful experiences on the water, uh, positive communication before and, and before anybody even has a chance to show up on site. You know, you talk about social media, that seems to be a regular theme that everybody loves to talk about these days. But at the end of the day, you've got a budget that you need to follow. You've got an event that, that the costs are sometimes significant and you need to spend really serious cash making sure that you're promoting your event properly to competitors. Some of you guys have the luxury of having big name events that competitors will show no matter what. But even still, there's a presence that you need to, to promote. You still need to make sure that that event, that the word gets out there. So how do you guys measure the success of those marketing efforts besides just quantity of boats that show? Well, that's pretty much the, the main one, in my opinion. We gotta get people on the water. That's what we're trying to do. We, we do this because it's fun. I mean, let's put it right out there. 
race, running regattas is a blast. Running good regattas is even more fun. So, so for us, when we see a, a huge number of boats come to a regatta, have a great time. Of course, it's always beautiful in Newport, it always blows 16 to 18 knots out of the southwest and sunny. So th that's never a problem. So it, it's, it's just, and, and it's just basically doing, doing what we do best will allow the next year to get bigger no matter what. It, it's just go out there, put your best foot forward, and, and I, gauge, I gauge a lot of these events on pure numbers. Numbers of sailors, numbers of smiles, and, and certainly um, you know, the numbers of classes when it comes to the Newport Regatta. Um, some of the bigger events, I mean, we do, we have to look at media impressions, and, and you're going to want to look at that as well, because your sponsors are going to want to know what kind of reach your event has. And that's something that we spend, you know, I'd love to say, we, we talk about budgets, you know, I'd love to have a flipping service, you know, as a, in my line item for my, my budget. We don't, so we sort of have to manually kind of track what magazine ads, everything that mentions Charleston Race Week, and bring that back so that when we talk to our sponsors, Here's who saw the event. And not only our sponsors, but our town. You know, I mean, Mount Pleasant and Charleston. They want to know who we're bringing into town. I mean, you know, and you can go out and get grants. I mean, you know, with those measurements, I mean, I think we are 4,900 room nights or something like that, which the town of Mount Pleasant just loves, you know, loves that. But most that measurement, you know, you know, it, but it's important to measure that as your event grows because that's what's going to allow you to obtain those sponsors that are so great. I think getting into the, you know, again going back into the electronic era. I mean, Google Analytics is great for that. Um, our, you know, by serendipity, we we catapulted. We we tried social media. We started with it in 2007. I think the first year we did a Facebook page, we had 100 people. We have over 8,900 people that follow the race to Mackinac. It's one of the highest grossing distance races uh, on Facebook. Um, for the 103rd when we had the accident, our numbers went off the charts. Part of that, and we've been able to retain that. Um, my fr the first year of my term, when we went on, um, we started with a plan. You know, we were thinking worst case scenario, because obviously the first year after the accident, we're thinking, all right, the media's gonna come at us, because what does everybody wanna know the first year after an accident? You know, what have you guys done different? So we kind of started with a plan, a media plan of, all right, what, what's changed? And we started to communicate that out there. What is different in this year's race? These are the things that we had talking points with the media. And we, we turned what could have been negative because the, the media wanted to go negative on us. They wanted to say, all right, well, there were these two deaths last year. You know, what have you done different so that there aren't deaths again? And then we turned it into a, into a positive to sell the things that we'd been working on all off season long and garner that, that, that media. We had, you know, the first year, I think we, we, we hit just underneath underneath 22.7 million impressions on, on Facebook. Um, and Google Analytics were off the chart again. Um, and we, used, um, we used Alan's service uh, in for the 104th is on the water recording service, and he got, a, he got great analytics um, on, on the media interviews that he did on, on, on his homepage. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's a lot of it starting with a plan, because at the end of the day, you're going back to those, you're going back to those, to the, to the same sponsors, and you're saying, all right, well, this is what this means to you. You know, you dollarize this 2.9 media, 2.9 million media impressions equals about 1.9 million in revenue to you if you're really to look at it. You know, last year we had over 200 media touch points at, in, in print, uh, TV, radio, or electronic. And it started with our plan, because our plan is, it, it focuses around humanizing the event. You heard next door talking about telling the story. The pa we, we, our, our game plan was called, the, you know, the pathway to the water. Tell the story of the racers. What are they going through to get to the, to the, to the race? You know, talk, talk about that, that woman who's the first, you know, first person in her family to do the race. You know, highlight, you know, the women in the sport, the minorities in the sport, something that's different. You know, look for your edge to make sure that people talk about that. And that's how you grow that. I mean, the media just eats that up. You know, they, they, they like that stuff. And, it, and that's how we ended up with 200 media impressions last year. That's incredible. I mean, that's as long as you stay consistent with that, you're going to keep growing it. Uh, we do an okay job in the media at Sail Newport for our stuff, but the thing that we've done the best is we measure the event's economic impact to the region, not just to Newport, to the region. And I've been able to kind of cobble that to get, uh, together over since about 2009 when we really started focusing on it and prove to the state of Rhode Island that sailing not yachting, sailing events, marine events, 
are economic drivers for Newport County and as far reaching as Providence, depending on the size of the event. So that allowed me far greater ability to get into the city manager's office, the state government, the Department of Administration, the uh, Economic Development Corporation, and the governor's office. Now it didn't hurt that the governor of Rhode Island is a sailor, he owns a J100, but at the end of the day, he still got to deal with his people down the line to say that you're not, you know, you're crazy, the sailing thing, but we've got it, and, and that's how we got the America's Cup World Series, that's how we got the Volvo Ocean Race, by making sure you invest in economic impact studies, because those things, you bring them into an EDC, they say, holy smokes, this is real money, and that can get you these little grants, these mini grants, so it's an easy way to get money. Well, and I think, Lou, you mentioned earlier, you guys use a specific company for that, is that, that IEG, is that right? Uh, well, originally we used IEG for, for that baseline evaluation of, of the race, and since then we've just kind of modeled off of that. Right. Perfect. Well, I mean, obviously you guys, as I said a couple times now, clearly do very large events uh, at a very high level. With that, uh, it's not just you guys. You know, when you want to put on a major event, the Sailing Report, no offense, it's not just Brad, it's not just Luke, it's not just Randy. What do you guys have for support staff for your events to help make that happen? And what do you guys have to give them for, for areas of focus to try to make sure that, that the event, how do you break the event down with the staff that you guys have? Uh, Good question, since I'm still working on the org chart for uh, 2013's uh, <laughs> 14th event. But, um, but we do, we, we have a staff of about 23 people that, and they're broken down into judges, race management, equipment, um, housing, um, and those groups meet almost every other week. And then you go to the, we actually have a volunteer coordinator for Shoreside and on the water as well. Um, and then once the event happens, we have probably, we, we shift into a mode of over 300 volunteers for the actual event. 300, that's awesome. Where do you find 300 volunteers? You know, some of them are in this room. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Some of them don't know it yet. But no, you know, and that that you know, and that's just the the lock and the draw of the event. You know, you your you, if your event grows, it's amazing how people want to participate, and then um, and the locals have been you know who don't sail are you know, every day. I'm getting emails. Well, when you you know, and we use a thing called Volunteer Spot to coordinate all our volunteers. It's kind of a neat little website um, that I'd recommend. Um, it's really easy to schedule everything. So that sounds great. But, well. I, we have a combination of professional staff and volunteers. And um, we train our volunteers on the water. We have training sessions to how to run a mark boat, to how to pull an anchor, how to set up a, a, a signal boat. We have um, a race officer, uh, Anderson still gonna be running uh, four or five regattas for us this summer. Uh, we also have an uh, overall regatta director, which is also a paid staff. Um, and then we have an events director. So we have a lot of paid staff at Sail Newport, but we are a grassroots volunteer organization. And I would say at a standard Newport regatta between the socials and the on the water activity, we're looking at well over 140 uh, volunteers, maybe closer to 180 volunteers, uh, running five circles on the water and running a big uh, series of socials, registration and all that. So it's a big puzzle and you have to have you, you have to have a smile on your face all the time to keep the volunteers coming back. You have to give them a really nice shirt and a nice hat and a nice meal. Make sure they have free drink tickets every night. Um, but to, to me, the most important thing that you have, and all, is it, how many people here are, are in um, volunteer-based organizations, whether it's a yacht club or sailing center? Anybody not in that and just total professional, everyone's paid? Well, obviously. <laughs> Mayor, are you paid? Yes. <laughs> so, um, but it, so, so it is a it is a puzzle. It is a complete puzzle on how we man these events and and get all the people uh, sussed out and, and and make sure they're in the right roles. You know, at at the, at the for the Mac Chicago Yacht Clubs, it's it's our signature event, but it's one of the many events that the, that the club does on the water. One of the, the 
20 something odd events that we do on the water. So like Brad said, we have a volunteer structure and then we also have a professional structure. For, so for every major position on the volunteer side, there's a, there's a professional kind of counterpart. But on the volunteer end of things, we've got a very corporate-like work chart. I mean, there's the chair and five vice chairs. And the vice chairs oversee five different major areas. Race operations, we, have, we also have a PRO in that. We have somebody that does communications and media. Um, when we were doing tracking, we had somebody that had E infrastructure and electronics. Uh, we had safety and measurement. Um, and those are the, the, all the, the key areas. Underneath there, you've got subcommittees that basically handle all the nuances. So it's a very organized, very deliberate structure. Um, so the MAC committee itself, the organizing committee is 20 people deep, all volunteers. Um, the race committee, when you start looking at the, the, the on the water team, which is, is amazing. I know, uh, I think Janet Batcher's in the room. She's our, our race chair. She kind of herds a, a lot of them and, and Lynn, uh, Lynn Lynch is here, so also does a lot of that work. But uh, I mean, that's over 100 volunteers, and they're doing events all summer long. So they pick the A team to go and do the MAC race. And you know, I mean, all, our our team's all really good. But I mean, it, it, it's the top notch that gets that you know that gets that MAC race because it's you know it's 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 sort of a privilege to to do that one signature event. So um, they kind of work through that. But it's you know it, it's it's a coordinated structure to get all those volunteers kind of herded and. You know, the work starts in August for the following year, since there's thousands of man hours that go into that. Yeah, they're, they're not easy undertakings, for sure. Before I forget, but you know, the MAC does a, 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 a nice job of maintaining the staff and its committees. And I think, you know, that's something that um, I want to point out about Race Week. I'm very careful to maintain my same PROs and the consistency and the consistency of the, easy for me to say, the, of the people involved in the event. So that, and, and a lot of you guys, there are maybe yacht club oriented where you have a churn, you know, of your yacht club boards annually. So you might have an event one year and then it's a whole different team. I strongly suggest that you organize a group that's responsible for the event so that there's a consistency to the management of the event. Very good point. Uh, but when you're looking at a major regatta, and you're hosting it, whether it's at a community sailing center or a yacht club, et cetera. Uh, oftentimes, a big event can be just a total logistical nightmare. What they all are. <laughs> Best what, plans go awry. Yeah. What are the biggest challenges, logistically speaking, that you guys have to face with your events? How do you manage them? I actually think we should have Ans Anderson answer that one himself as the moderator. Brad, you are my logistical oh, nightmare. damn it. <laughs> <laughs> The logistics, uh, like I, you know, uh, we've actually started developing a little bit more of an org chart at Sail Newport. Um, for us, it's just all hands on deck for every one of these regattas that we run. We also have a thousand kid youth program. We also have rental programs and adult lessons and all the other really cool things that we do at Sail Newport. But at the end of the day, the logistical nightmare if it isn't drawn out and consistent from regatta to regatta to regatta, you're gonna drive yourself insane. So whether it's a keelboat regatta, they gotta go over here to, to rig. Whether it's a dinghy regatta, they gotta go over here to rig. The press is all the same. You do the same things. You do a consistent uh, way of uh, talking to people before they get there, while they're there, and when they leave. It has to be a consistent approach. Hey, you know, you. I think you've heard me talk about a lot of the planning that goes into the MAC race. And no matter how long you plan, there's always something that goes sideways on you. Nothing's ever smooth. We have a running joke amongst the MAC chairs that every MAC chair has a signature issue that goes on, you know. The guy prior to me was, you know, obviously we had the 103rd of the accident. That was very unfortunate. Um, you know, I had the docking, you know, docking gate, we call it, you know, in my first run around, you know. Uh, other guys have had other issues, you know. It's just, there's always something that goes awry. But, you know, again, you can think, you can think it, front ways, sideways, upside down, and backwards, and inevitably, Murphy's Law goes into play. So you gotta be prepared with a contingency plan. I mean, one of the things that we've done on the back end of, and we, we've always had it in place, but we formalized it a lot more on the back end of the 103rd, the accident, was our emergency plan that, that, we, that, that our, the PRO kinda did in play. Um, and that really kinda governs how we handle things should something go sideways from, you know, uh, it being a, a, an on the water issue, a weather issue, uh, thunderstorm, you know, anything that would, anything that could possibly go on. What's the chain of command? You know, because in our race, you know, the, 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 for all major purposes, the chair does the race. So, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, the minute, the minute I turn the baton over to our PRO, that individual runs the race 
while I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a competitor, so there's no conflict of interest. So basically, I have no communication unless something major happens. But there's a whole triage team that ha that, that kind of takes over with that. Emergency plan. What are logistics? <laughs> <laughs> what other people do, Randy? Okay. <laughs> I've got people that do that for me, probably, I got people. and I don't even know it. <laughs> No, you do have to have backup plans. I mean, we're, we're, we struggle through our growth of you know, getting boats out of the water and, and things of that nature. And, and, and you're also, you, know, you can plan it and plan it and plan it and then something will go awry. But um, all I can say is just plan for it and then understand that when it does happen, it just happens. That's a regatta. Right. Yeah. You know, kids regattas have a little bit more of a, you know, a need for incredibly tight controls on the safety plans. We have this event we do every th two or three years called the Optimist New Englands. Has anybody been to a Sail Newport Optimist New Englands here? Okay, was anybody here during the car carrier year? Okay, well, we have 400 or so Opti's out there. And we're right north of the bridge in, in Narragansett Bay and we have all four flights in the middle of a race. And a car carrier comes from Quonset Point, which is this big, car place over there, comes right between uh, Gould Island and Jamestown. And the thing is coming. And the PRO who has Channel 13 on, Ron Hopkins, does a great job. Sir, captain, Captain, we have this event here. Is there any way you can go outside the channel on the other side of this island? No, nope, no. Nope. Sir, Cap, we're gonna weave right through. <laughs> weave right through. So, so, at Sail Newport, we have a base station that we can hear basically Russia with this thing. So we hear all this chatter coming on. It's, we call it the Sarah Palin station because it can hear Russia. So actually, literally, we can hear a Russian freighter that's out there all the time. So we, Sarah Palin's on the horn and we have Kim Cooper get on the horn w with our race officer and immediately she is, the, she is the person in charge of communication in the office. She is in the office making sure that there's a situation, there is a procedure that she follows. She called Coast Guard Station Castle Hill, they put her up to the safety office, which got to the pilot on board and had a 450 foot car carrier turn around for an Opti Regatta, which was great. Now. Does that, is that the right thing to have happened? No, because there was some lessons learned from it and we, we knew that you know, we had done our homework, we knew it was coming, we had talked to the pilot, everything was gonna be good, but at the end of the day, things go sideways and when it's 450 feet long with 400 Opti sailors, it can be a, it can be a bad day. <laughs> Glad I was not a part of that one. That was, um, was pre-Anderson. So we, you know, we talk a little bit about sort of setting the expectations for an event, and, and oftentimes you know, you've got your challenges with competitors and logistics, dealing with getting everything set up and operating, and everybody often thinks that as soon as the first race starts, everything's just going to flow smoothly from there, and everything's just going to be totally copacetic. How exactly do you guys continue to maintain the positive relationship that you work so hard to build with your competitors before they arrive? How do you make sure that that still, fo still moves forward throughout the entire duration of your event? Well, if, the, if it goes bad on the water, we just blame the PRO. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting, because I, I, I think uh, we talked about the, the survey. And, you know, there's no, there's, there's no such thing as bad feedback, that I think it's really listening to your electorate on what they want. And, and not being afraid to, to, to try different things and change as things come about. You know, in 2007, um, you know, the committee took a risk and, and, and opened up the cruising division for the race to Mackinac. You know, we allowed boats to, you know, to kind of do it as, it as its own cruising entity. And that, that is when one of our fastest growing divisions over the last, you know, six, seven years. It's been amazing how much that's grown. But, you know, again, we listened to the, to the electorate and they said, hey, listen, this would be great to add. And, and we did it. You know, we have multi hulls in the race. That, that, that was another offshoot of that. Um, yeah, it's just been, it's been a lot of different things. So, I mean, I think you have to set, you know, that relationship with, with your client base. And, and I think, Brad, you said it best. You know, they're your customers. The race is for them. So, um, at the end of it all, um, I, I kind of, I kind of, I equate the Mac race, anybody that's gone through a wedding, you know, the two people getting married, you know all the things you missed because you know that you had this plan in place. 
your guests all think it went great. So, you know, and you're sitting there beating yourself up. Oh, we forgot to say our vows on, you know, you were supposed to go first to the vows and then me, blah, 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 you know, it's all stuff. Yeah, but to everybody else, it went perfect. So we know where all the bombs are, you know, internally with the committee, but at the end of the day, you, you don't let them see you sweat. I think, was it P.T. Barnum said it best? You don't let them see you sweat. Or WC Beals, whoever it was, you know. But, and, 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 and just kind of put, yeah, somebody said it, but yeah, you just kind of put it. Yeah, Houdini maybe, I don't know. That, you know, you, you kind of you put the event down for them and, and you try to make changes, take that, that you know, push, push the envelope a little bit to, to, to keep the race relevant. You know, and that's how we've been able to kind of hit, you know, 300 plus folks in the year. And we're also blessed with a lot of folks in the concentric areas. That's the other dynamic. But, yeah. And it goes, Brad, Brad was joking, but the PRO is the heart and soul of our event. You know, so it does really kind of fall. Um, and I, there are a lot of PROs, you know, in this room today, but you guys are who's driving the bus, you know, and you're going to control the situations out there. And that's why, you know, we were very selective in our PROs. We know who, they know who the fleets they're working with very well. Um, but it is, it's very, very important that you have the right PRO in the right position on the course. And once you've got it, that's their race to run. It's not, a, you know, it's not mine. I can't go out there and change it. So. Well, thanks, guys. That's sort of all that we had prepared for you guys, uh, given us still about another 15 minutes. We would open it up to questions for anything that, uh, that you guys might have for these three up here. Uh, here in the front in the blue. I've uh, got a question for Brad first. Brad, you know, I'm leaving last time and you bought the Gannon and a few long time ago. All that. Now uh, we're going to move the, the Newport Regatta into February, so we're nice and fresh. Uh, no, I, there's a lot that goes into uh, our little public sailing center, and um, so there's a lot of planning. There's a lot of, uh, but we look forward to the racing season. It's a blast, and the regattas are. It's when we have fun, so uh, we don't get burned out. Maybe until maybe September. But uh, this year we have, uh, we start off with a kid event in, in, the, in the early part of June. Oh, actually, we have a moth event in May. Uh, we help with the Etchell's Worlds. We're going to run the Newport Regatta. Uh, we'll help a little bit with Race Week at New York Yacht Club. Uh, we run uh, Melgis tw uh, 32, a Melgis 20, uh, the Classic Yacht Regatta, the J24 Worlds, Sail for Hope. Did I miss, what did I miss? You missed the J70 Worlds. The J70 Worlds we're going to be helping with. So uh, we, do have, we do have quite a lot. You, uh, you do a little testing. You know, we started out with probably one circle in shore. And it, I think when I first took over, I, you know, we're just gonna be able to handle one circle. You know, and that was all we could do, you know? So we had a few classes. Well, then we had, you know, some more boats wanting to race and show up, well, I think we can, you know, squeeze in two circles. You know, and then we actually grew into three circles. And now we are kind of hitting, you know, a limit for us. You know, I mean, we've had to cap classes this year for the first time. Um, everybody, for some reason, in Charleston, you know, they just want to be inside the harbor. You know, we'd love, we've got all the ocean in the world four miles away, you know. We could take you out there. Um, but what we have to do is say, all right, this is about the limit, the capacity we have right now for inshore. So we look at, you know, it is actually Charleston Race Week, you know? It's not just a three-day event. You know, do we actually, you know, we look at expanding the event. And that comes back to, you know, circles right back to the business model. You know, can we do that? Well, we couldn't have done that four years ago. But now we can, you know? So, so we'll look at trying to expand the length of the event and move fleets in and out during that week to accommodate the boats that still want to attend that we're turning, you know, we're turning away now. So. I think like, like Randy, there's physical constraints in, in harbor and dockage for the Mac race. So on the Chicago side, there's, there's physical constraints. On the, uh, the island side, there's also a lot of physical constraints. We really tested it, I think, in 2008 for the 100th running when we had 475 registered boats, 435 on the line. So that was kind of the, the, the peak, I would think. 
Um, now with water levels being what they might be, you know, who knows after this ice cap, you know, melts this year, what it's going to be. Well, it'll it'll be up, but you know, again, you're limited by depth levels, and you know, boats are getting deeper and you know more challenging to come apart. So there is that limitation. So to manage growth, once you're sold out or you think you're approaching sold out, you have to stick to your class limits. Like you you've experienced this before, I think at the Newport regatta or come close. We have an eight boat limit. It's a one design regatta. If you can't get more than eight boats, you're on super secret probation. If we can fit you, we'll fit you. But if we can't, we can't. And we turned away, last year we had to turn away the Flying Dutchman. We've had to turn away the Snipe before. We've had to turn away from some really great classes because they just didn't have enough. We can't have a circle of eight classes of three boats. And so we do stick to our limits and it's it, it brings some heartburn. It's a hard phone call to make, so that's why I make Anderson make them. <laughs> Gentleman in the light. Yeah, maybe you guys have forgotten this, but if you decide, like, okay, we're running three circles, and you have one circle that you really need, like, two more fleets on, and so you'd like to invite the uh, lightnings and the thistles, as an example, to come, do you pursue them, or do you just put in the notice of race, we want you to come and go talk to the local fleet? I mean, what do you do to get that fleet there because they're kind of a target fleet for you. You do go, I mean, you can go after the class, you know, and, and you want them, you know, if you if you want them there. And you go to the, you know, um, you, know you try to find out who the head of the class is and, and get some, you know, pitch them and sell them on the idea. And, and then it becomes a whole package, you know, it comes back to your, this, that logistics word of where, you know, hey, come to our regatta. Here's what, here's how it's gonna work. You know, I, I don't know about, you, but I don't like surprises. You know, I really want to know what I'm comfortable with and the bet. You know, how I'm going to get my boat in and out, and how I'm going to get there, and all those good things. So yeah, you can go out and solicit classes if you want. Um, well, that's what we do all the time. We we send out outward emails to all the classes that we want because we know there's critical mass within the region or the Northeast or the Mid Atlantic. So um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of J boat classes. There's a lot of J boats around New England. So uh, if you're running a regatta in, in um, you know, Skinny Atlas Lake, you're not gonna invite Melgis 32s, but you're gonna invite the Thistle class, the Lightning class, and so you, you stick with what you know you can run, you stick within your core competency. Don't try to run a maxi boat regatta when you're used to running snipe regattas. So, or, you know, have a business model to adapt to it. Next question. Robert. Lou. Do you mean in the in the survey? We we get a you know we usually get about a little bit over a third of the surveys back. So let's say we've got 300 skippers, you know we'll get about over 100 surveys back. On the crew side, it's 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 deeper than that. Is a, I mean, the, the crew all have. I mean, and everybody's opinion counts. You know, I mean, there's different perspectives to what we're doing. So, you know, we've got a, a large perspective, large, large percentage of those uh, surveys back. And, you know, we kind of call through them, get the top issues, and then that gets built into the next year's plan. You know, uh, obviously if there's a big issue, that that becomes top line priority, but you know, other, otherwise, you know, you kind of look at where you can kind of take off and win. How do you balance your social schedule and your racing schedule with the variables of wind? Do you run more races and miss dinner? Or how, how do you communicate that with your PRO and keep your flexibility? Well, we have about, a, was it 160 gallons of rum to serve at our regatta, so we're always coming <laughs> off a little bit early. <laughs> but it, it depends on the night. Like some yacht clubs have a big pressure to get the competitors into the yacht club to go to the bar, to eat their dinner, to, to go to a big function. So that, that one night you have to just, you gotta make the call, you know, the last race, PRO's last race is going to be three today, and we, we need these guys and girls off the water. That's one pressure, and you just don't do anything about it. You, uh, you know, if you lose a day of racing, there's a big pressure to start earlier, so we start earlier to get more races in. Um, you certainly, especially when you have a big sponsor or a series of sponsors that are expecting a thousand people under a tent, you can't wait till eight o'clock to let that happen. You have to get them off the water. You know, that's the beauty of not having sponsors sometimes. You can do whatever you want, but uh, you, you just got to adapt. Um, um, I 
don't think it's, it's, it's a, a big mistake that two of you guys are running your event without a yacht club to worry about. Um, and that only, only you, you. <laughs> um, and that, that, Luke, uh, that the MAC has such a very well organized way of not only bringing the, the incoming director up to speed, but keeping you on for what, three years, right? So, so here's here's my question. Already said, you know, if you have an incoming board and you have a, every you know, every every year you have one new person running the event, it's it's a mess. It's very hard to deal with. Um, is there a way, especially for Blue, is there a way, or maybe some sort of a, a system that, that for those for those clubs that can't sort of get get out, get their head out of the sand and, and, and instantly get better, or, or can't get enough buy-in from the membership to have multi-year commitments from your directors? Is there a way to, to do it so that you can still run it over God without being on the group for years? We've had a variety through the history of the MAC. I mean, I'm, I was the 21st chair of chair this race. I mean, we started in like 1972 with the chairman, and before that it was run by the race committee and the Commodore. But, um, you know, it, there's, it, this builds into the club's philosophy, and there's a succession planning process that happens. So this is built up to the selections and nominating committee, and, you know, they, they factor in. Um, you know, you heard my work chart earlier where there's the chair and then five vice chairs. Well, you, as you bring people on the team, you bring them, you obviously you bring them for what they're good at. There's, you work within their capabilities and skill set. But those five vice chairs, any one of them should be able to step up into the, the chair role. I mean, that's the goal. So you, you have a succession plan. And, and, you know, and, and it's a two-year rotation. I'm, I, I am, and, the, and our club's philosophy is that turnover is good. Because when you get incumbency, you got to get flat-footed and stale. So you need a new team to come in, a new chair to come in, a new leader to come in, and set a new vision. And, and then, you know, set his management style in place so that you can accomplish that vision, you know. So it's important to do that. But I think it really starts with the succession plan. And we've had, it, we've had uh, chairs in the 21 years, uh, 22 years of now having chairs that uh, had it done one-year terms for whatever reason. Um, but in general, the cycle has been, you know, two years of vice chairmanship and then uh, two years of chairmanship. I was thrown into a pickle after the 103rd. Uh, Win Soldani, who uh, was on the committee, he had a personal issue that took him out of the Chicagoland area. So he was on tap to be the next chair. So all of a sudden they're like, all right, Jesus, now what do we do? And I mean, I, I had the experience to kind of step up and, and, and do the job. So I'd, I had done media relations for the 107th and you know, kind of worked in that capacity. I'd been on the committee long enough to understand the nuts and bolts. So they're like, all right, it's your turn in the barrel. And um, so I did, a one chair of, I, I did a one year of vice chair. Mine was a little like, typical term. I had one year of vice chair and two years of chairmanship. You know, and then off to the happy sunset. <laughs> Next question. Corey, yeah. Uh, yeah, my question has to do with sponsorship fulfillment, and maybe, Randy, you could help answer this question. Um, what sorts of things are you considering um, to satisfy the sponsors, and what are they asking for? You know, most of them are really just asking for attendance. You know, I mean, we're providing a, a number of people a lot of, um, of circulation. I mean, our, our, our event's pretty unique in that there's kind of a, a venue with a beach that kind of traps everybody there. So let's say Sperry's gonna be very key on, hey, do I have the same crowd? Do I have the same, same number of faces that we're touching and, and communicating through, through the event? Um, they don't, you know, we talked about media impressions, they're looking at some of that stuff, but mostly it's really just exposure to new, cu new, new customers is another, you know, they're, they're eager to, to see, you know, they like to see new faces there at, at our regatta, um, but mostly it's just, yeah, it's just really the attendance of the regatta that they seem to thrive on. And they're, you know, and, and quite answering their questions whenever they ask. Well, also getting them in front uh, to what they, if they want to do this, they need to engage the sailing lifestyle, w whether it's a shoe company or whether it's an investment bank. And having someone there to speak on behalf of their organization on why they're linked with the sailing event is very powerful. Now, uh, Fidelity Investments, for example, whenever they come to speak at any function, they send somebody fairly high up to come and hand the plates out. That, never underestimate the power of hand it, having them hand the trophy to someone. 
and it's very important. I think Key West did that well, is doing that uh, continually well, where they also always have their sponsors up there giving, the, giving those trophies away. So, and I know you guys do that. You guys have your folks there. Don't you? We don't. We no, we actually let our PROs hand out our trophies. Although, it's a good thing, because we do, we, do, we do the uh, daily trophies out of the Sperry Cottage, though. So, you, I'm, you know, we were right, and I didn't even know it. I believe you have time for one last question, if anybody has one. Cocktail time. Thank you guys very much.